Coming up next is a conversation I had not too long ago. Corruption is perceived as a band of our development. So how do we deal with a canker that's gradually hampering our growth? Here's a playback of my conversation at the Fiesta Royal Hotel with great guests. Hello, welcome to Corruption Scoreboard. Second year of governance, round two in the corruption boxing ring. How is President Ekufuado's government doing in the fight against corruption? But we also ask the question, is the government being too slow in fighting corruption. How are everyday people involved in the fight against corruption? Let me introduce to you my guest, the CEO of the Private Enterprise Federation, Anose Bonsu. Also seated is Mr. Kwame Ahiagbanu, his executive director, Pens Plus Bytes, and Mr. Amidu Ibrahim Tanko, his program director, Star Ghana. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I guess quickly, I would want to find out your perception uh, about corruption in Ghana today. I'll start from you. Well, I think the perception, in my opinion, is still quite high, that corruption is on the high side. We've seen a few promising moves by the government, the um, appointment of the special prosecutor, etc., etc. Uh, recently, we heard of some um, chief executive officers being fired, um, even though the reasons were not directly linked but i mean there's that perception out there but i think there are other equally important things that are not being done right information still pending um there was a very worrying um trend or activity if i say where the president was defending you know some people who had been accused you know at his first first conference and i thought that it didn't send the right signal that if even he knew that those people weren't corrupt, let the relevant agencies pronounce so. But overall, I think Ghanaians too will focus a lot on grand corruption. Mm. And so if there are moves about firing politicians, firing chiefs, chief executives, then we think that something is being done about corruption. But petty corruption that affects our everyday lives, mm. that manifests in losses of lives, you know, poor access to um, services, terrible education outcomes where we're last ranked in the world, those are caused by, in a way, petty corruption. Mm. But we don't focus on that. So long as we hear the president firing somebody today and firing somebody tomorrow, we think something is being done about corruption. So I think we equally need to focus on that. Mm petty corruption, how it's affecting us, whether anything is happening in those directions. So it's, for me, a mixed picture. Okay. And a lot more really needs to be done at all levels, mm. from the presidency right down to us as citizens who encourage and pay those kind of bribes. Ms. Ahia, I know you carried out a uh, research not too long ago. What were your findings? Basically, they're finding support to the assertion by Mr. Tanko that corruption perception is still very high. And one thing we have to note is that for a lot of Ghanaians, they were waiting for things to happen with the appointment of the office of, the, uh, of Martin Amidu. But that did not uh, result in anything tangible immediately. Mm. One, and indeed, nothing has happened. happened. Yes, yes, yes. So, but no, but of course, getting the appointment announced and the office established is a good move. Yeah. But for a lot of Ghanaians also, they are expecting that leadership, which is government, should do things that will ensure that we reduce corruption. But the steady point to the fact that citizens have a role to play. You and I have a critical role to play. And we are like maybe outsourcing the fight uh, against corruption to somebody. And we are not uh, stepping up our game in terms of what we can do as individuals or in societies or in organizations. Hmm. <coughs> okay. um, Nana, from where you sit, private and enter private enterprise foundation, uh, how would you, federation, how would you rate the corruption perception in Ghana today? Perception is assumed presence of an occurrence of an activity. That's perception. Hmm. Basically because people don't have confidence, or basically because people don't have information. Absence of information creates my own idea of what may be happening. Mm. Also because we don't have proof. Yes, so perception doesn't have proof. It's my idea of what may be happening. <coughs> so it's the best thing that the government can do, release information, timely, so people can have access to that. 
to make, there's only one fight, but different perception and different uh, opinions. Mm. So if governments were to release information at every time that is required, then people wouldn't have these innuendos and all these uh, hearsay that say and all that. Where I said is that the, the passage of the act of the OSP, of the Special Prosecutor, is a big step. The appointment is another big step. And I always caution speed to be tampered with uh, doing the best logistics in place so you don't falter along the way. We haven't seen the actions or the results of what the office can do. I would tamper that with people to enable the special prosecutor to, it just what, a few months ago that the assistant was appointed. The board is not even in place. And that's one of the things that it, the dangers of having a special prosecutor running on its own without a board, because the board has to be in place, and I think it's uh, uh, in the interest of government to appoint the board as, as, uh, you know, as fast as mm -hmm. possible. So as uh, Mr. Tanko indicated, there are positive signs, but there are also things that we can do. Right to information, critical. You see, information allows all of us to share the same platform. But if information is held by others, and I'm scrambling to do, I have create my own information mix, and I can then base my uh, position or arguments on the basis of false information, good or bad. Mm. So that information bit is critical, that right to information. The other point is people's access to uh, the whistleblower's uh, arrangement. Why are people not participating? Mm. One of the things that you know we need as a citizenry, as a community of people, we have a responsibility to ourselves to protect the assets of the state. How are the Ghanaian citizenry performing? We sit on the fence, expect some few, the government and a few uh, you know, civil society people to do that for us. We should be empowered and empower ourselves. The people that are running the government came from within us from the community. And we know who they are and what they had before they became politicians. Mm. The next morning, the guy is riding a Mercedes. He's building a home. What happens? The society should shun him as a thief. No, otherwise, the society goes to him every morning. Good morning, sir. Because they want some of the crumbs <laughs> falling the on the table time. to come to <laughs> us. You bring your mommy's uh, hospital bill. You bring your son's or daughter's uh, school bill. Where's you, where do you expect the guy to get the money from? So you actually influencing him because, hey, I want to look good. He wants to want to look good. Mm. So he, you influencing him to go and steal from somebody to be able to do. And if he's going to be able to give it to you, he has to keep the lion's share for himself. And that <laughs> will perpetrate, yeah, that perpetrates the corruption mm. and the perception of corruption because, you know, you see the guy riding the Mercedes. It might be for his friend. It might be from a relative because, hey, he's brought some good things to the family, so family together. But let's get the facts. The facts are one. The information is one. So it's critical that we as people hold the politicians accountable, hold the office holders accountable. And as Mr. Tanko indicated, we only look for the, the hurricane, the big game. There are a lot Don't of they steal them. the most money? I, I beg to disagree. Collectively, when you aggregate the small pieces and you know, together, they amount to a lot. They amount to a lot. But corruption is corruption, whether it's for five cents or for 50 cities. And so we should be looking at, because you're going to the, the, the office, the guy that is supposed to give you information, oh, can you wait? You wait, he's going back and forth. Mm. Oh, okay, why don't you take this two CD and then see what you can do? Oh, yes, sir. And then oh, next time, the information is available. <laughs> he doesn't see that as a corruption. Mm. Let me give you one example. We did a corruption at Techi, uh, Techiman. 350 people, anti-corruption uh, workshop. And this man raises his hand, okay, he's a driver. He parked his car at a location where he's not supposed to park because he was crossing the street to buy medication for his sick wife. He parked illegally. The policeman came. He was going to give him a ticket. The guy runs back. Oh, officer tried to explain. The officer won't listen. He gave him 10 CDs. The officer took it and let him go. Why do we think that is corruption? Why do we think that is illegal? Hmm. Because he got his way. The policeman was also happy, and nothing happened. That's the understanding of the public of corruption. But you know, 
Um, I like to talk about reality, and I think that the examples you gave, these are realities. If I refuse to do it, uh, the next person will do it. If, can I stand al alone in the fight against corruption, Mr. Tanko? I think that is where, when we're talking about what needs to be done, um, we need to mobilize citizens. Because um, gone are the days of um, the Robin Hoods and the uh, American action heroes. You know, one person has a gun and he goes around and does everything. We need to be able to mobilize citizens around a common agenda. Now, mobilizing citizens around a common agenda requires that we break down the conversations around corruption into um, issues framing the resonance with citizens that my uncle in the village up north, who is a farmer, is not suddenly going to go onto the streets because we are talking about, say, for example, Woyomi or Bost or whatever. But he's willing to take a stand if that thing is reduced to his access to fertilizer mm -hmm. for a very, very short rainy season, mm. to the performance of his child in school. So we need to talk about, to mobilize citizens, first, the information needs to be made available. But to be made available in a way that makes sense. And then, of course, citizens can ask. But if there's no response, they get discouraged. So what are we doing about the institutional responsiveness side? Um, City FM, I think, the other day broadcast um, a letter from a citizen about the roads in his community. Hmm. And this guy had done very detailed research, etc., 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 and was demanding information. Who else was picking it up? We have 110 ministers. Exactly. You know, so we need to be able to mobilize citizens, but we also need to work on that responsiveness, that when it goes there, we find ways of ensuring that those uh, queries are responded to, mm. and that will then incentivize other citizens to step up. In this I way. think I will ask you the same question. Yeah, in the research we did, one of the, just following up, one of the issues that we want to look at is school feeding program. And a lot of respondents uh, were very passionate about that because it's something they can relate to, mm. especially people who are in the villages and all that. They want their wards to have the best of education, and having a hot meal at school is quite critical. Mm. But what do they see? Uh, when uh, the new government came in, uh, into power, all the previous caterers were moved and new ones were brought Which in. Which is really what happens every, time. every four yes. years. Yeah, but now the, the citizens are saying that, look, this cannot continue, largely because it's impacting on them. What happens? Instead of their walls going to school, they are, they are made to carry firewood because the caterer who received the funds to cook, which include firewood, is not qualified or is pocketing half of the money. Mm. So this case, instead of being in school, have to go and look for firewood, bring it to the caterer for the caterer to cook poor quality food for them. So uh, just touching on practical examples, some of these things impact on people on a day-to-day basis. Mm. You mentioned that, okay, uh, if I don't act on it, somebody else, somebody will. else will. But we have to uh, understand that if we continue acting on it, at the end of the day, it's going to be expensive for everybody. And I think that's the message that we are pushing with our study. And the study was anchored, for example, manifesto promises. Remember, uh, um, prior to the last election, there was a lot of promises going around. Mm -hmm. And we are focusing on what are the promises that the political parties were making in the fight against corruption. Mm -hmm. And the MPP government documented a lot of them. So after coming to power, we went back to people. They, they had up the pro promises they can relate to them. What's the government doing about it? Mm. And these are some of the ways that we want to mobilize citizens around the issue that, look, you have been promised. Uh, have the promise that they made to you been kept? And we believe that through some of this mechanism, we can mobilize. And mobilization is key. Making people uh, aware that, look, uh, the resources belong to them. And it does not matter if it's one city or 100,000. It's our resources, and we have to make sure that we protect it and ensure that it can be used for our benefit. Nana, private enterprise federation. Yes, ma'am. Sometimes I think we mourn for the private sector. Yes. Because usually they can't even speak. No. Nope. Who are you to? You'll be targeted. 
thank you. <laughs> thank you. Because you see, the, the wrong perception, and I always go by this perception, that mm. private sector is the supply side of corruption. Mm. The businessman has invested their livelihood. They're going to do business every which way, at all costs. So when there's demand and what we call extortion on them before they can perform, they will do because they cannot let their business suffer. Mm. But we have to find ways to protect the private sector against demands from, for you know, services, against extortion, because they're not empowered on their own as to what do we do. And in our community where you know, the leaders and the, uh, even the law enforcement is looking to get reward because they protected somebody, it makes the private sector very, very vulnerable. So our point is that how do we educate our people to stand against demands? How do they go behind the scenes to get the bidding documents before the bid is uh, an announced? Because it works in their own behalf if they all discipline themselves mm -hmm. as to toe the line, wait to our turn, get the documents right and all. But when they see, as you said, if this person is not going to do it, why should I be the Lone Ranger? Mm. But if you don't do it, who else do you expect to do it? So you have to set the example. And gradually, as a community, we learn by practice. We learn other people are doing it. So then it rubs on you that, oh, well, I don't want to do this, but I mean, everybody's going, why mm -hmm. shouldn't I? But if we see that we are the exception, it makes it very difficult for us that, you know, uh, I can be singled out. Retribution for a businessman is one of the weapons that they are scared of because my business is going to suffer. And now we don't want to go to this meeting. Why? Because, you know, they might take pictures and they see me and say, oh, this is a guy who spoke. You know, <laughs> no, that's legit, yeah. legit concern for businesses. So for the business, how do we protect, create the ethics standards mm. so that they say, okay, this is how we together and it got to be a collective action. We together can now say, as a platform, none of us, if you break the ranks, we're going to sideline you and we're not going to participate, you know, work with you. Mm. So there are ways and avenues that we can empower people. But as I said, the, the, the citizenry, as a community, we have to rise up and say, okay, yesterday we weren't participating. But today now, as he said, deprivation of services, health, education, and other things are not coming in a way that my son is going to school under the shade, under the trees. When it rains, he can go. And when, you know, uh, for whatever reason, other things. So if, and one of the things that the, the nation has failed is the cost of, cost benefit analysis of corruption. We haven't done enough analysis to show that this is what led to A. Mm. We assume that the corruption was corruption, that the money went to somebody's pocket, but we're okay. We're not okay. Our roads are bad, our medical services, the educational services, all because if you look around, the communities, Accra, Kumasi, Takrati, all these big something homes, they're owned by government. Because it's government money that was siphoned for people to build those. Mm. And I call them, and you see, somebody asked the other day, what's the meaning of corruption? I said, I don't know. Because we have given it this plausible, beautiful name. It's stealing, simple. <laughs> okay. So just to add that, it's important that we make the, distin uh, the distinction between private sector and uh, uh, public, uh, private and public sector corruption. Sure. But we have to agree that corruption is corruption. In corruption is stealing. Yes. Thank you. In respect Thank you. if it's Thank private you. sector, yeah. But we need to know, uh, know that there is a relationship as I mentioned, private sector guys will pay uh, maybe funds to public officials to make sure that they have their contracts. There is also private to private sector corruption, mm -hmm. where businesses will pay money to businesses. And I think we have not looked at that aspect well, largely because we think that it's private, it's not our money. But it's quite important mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we are all in this society. Mm -hmm. Today I'm working with a private uh, entity. Tomorrow I become a minister. Mm. Now the private sector have trained me to still. <laughs> so what happened? When I get into office, I put up that behavior. So it's important that we look at corruption across mm. and 
ensure that we give it the name, as you say, still in. Mm. But more importantly, we have to understand that if we don't solve it across board, it's going to impact on us. Mm. I wonder, uh, Mr. Tanko, who doesn't pay the 10%? It's become natural. Like if you, if you, if you want a contract, yes. you have to pay something. Yeah. You know you have to sort somebody out. Mm. Yes, I was reading a very provocative article, and I think the author uh, meant to be provocative. And said there's actually something called beneficial corruption. Mm -hmm. that, that the type of corruption that oils the wheels of business, you know, the economy. And so, so long as it makes things move and etc., that who are we to say? And that, for example, the so called advanced countries, they started with the Rockefellers and the whatever not, who started really doing the kinds of things that are listed. But we don't have that luxury that they had of you know, gradually moving out of it. The cost of corruption to us is so serious that we can't begin to think about beneficial corruption. Corruption, as they say, is stealing. It manifests itself daily that an ambulance, you know, I, I, I watched, I think it was on um, one of the multimedia platforms where a patient was brought from Krachi in an ambulance, they got to Kolebu, and because somebody was not paying something, even to get the patient on a stretcher out of the ambulance, that is the effect of corruption. That a child goes to school day in, day out, teachers are not there, teachers have been posted to that district, to that school, nobody does anything, the children fail, they end up on the streets, and daily we see the police that there's a swoop. And you go and swoop these children. But we don't trace it back today. Mm -hmm. So it is something that poses almost for me an existential threat to us as a nation and we need to fight it. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so on the ten percent is an interesting one. As where you can institutionalize it. So you want your passports yeah. early. So you pay premium and get the service. So that can be done. But on the other hand also, what happens is that we end up paying the 10%. Mm -hmm. If the contract is 100,000, you will make sure that it's inflated by the cost of the 10%. So it means that the cost of the project is going to be high. So the solution is to make sure, as Nana said, about visibility. Now, if contracts are being offered, it's all open, we can all bid, the information is made available, mm. there's no need for me to come and pay 10% to you because I've gone through the due process. Mm. However, the situation where the information is not available, it's restrictive tendering, or uh, it's done so as an, it's so sourcing, what happens? That 10% opportunity is created. Mm. And I also want to agree with Mr. Tanko that it's a marketplace. Unfortunately, corruption is not embedded in our system of thought, living and the way we do business, mm. which means that the supply and demand and if you, we are going to look at corruption when we come to the solution, we have to look at how do we ensure that this market forces which the supply and demand are worked on in a manner that can what, uh, uh, reduce corruption by what, taking mm. it from the, mm. its core, which is that it's not uh, integrated into our system of life. Let, let, let me chip in mm. here with what Tanko said, beneficiary corruption. Mm. What does it supposed to do? Facilitate speed of action. In certain jurisdictions, you know what they call it? Facilitation fees. Now, if you allow facilitation fees, as is done in certain jurisdictions in the EU and others, and you don't constitute or classify that as corruption, that is bad. Because in facilitation fee is to speed up maybe some kind of viability studies and quick, quick, quick wins. Mm. But for a contract of two billion, what percentage of facilitation fees? Ten percent is two hundred million. Hmm. One percent is twenty million. In my jurisdiction, twenty million is huge sums of money. People don't talk about. It. Only governments talk about. It. So once we allow and saying corruption and fancy names and facilitation fees, let's call a spade a spade. Somebody is taking undue advantage of his position to or his or her position to enrich hmm. themselves unduly. And that is taking assets don't belong to them. We have to find a way, let them feel guilty about it. Let the community point at them that you are an ostracized uh, ostrich and shouldn't be part of the society. Mm. But we don't. They become the pillars of the community. 
church services, they sit at near, near the pulpit, uh, harvest, they're the chair. Here's a guy who couldn't even come near the church. All of a sudden, he's a politician, he's been appointed to a certain position, he has wealth that he un unlawfully acquired, and he becomes a pillar. What example are we setting? So the young guy sitting there says, okay, now that's the way I'm going to go. I did a work work uh, workshop in Cape Coast, invited some Cape Coast University students. And they came, and we're talking about merits of, uh, you know, uh, education and how it can lead you to professional and career development. One guy got up, he says, sir, ain't going to work. I said, what? He said, you get it whom you know. And I was new in town, so I was like, are you crazy whom you know? <laughs> no, nobody is going to know you and give you anything unless you qualify. But at the end of the day, I came to realize that it's whom you know. Because if your parents can lead you to the minister, let, let me go step back. Somebody come from the United States, they want to see the minister. Believe me, within the next 12 hours, they will see the minister. We sit here, business associations, you want to see the minister. Appointments are delayed, postponed, and sometimes canceled. Why do we allow that? Because the expectation of some unsavory symbiotic relationship can be created under the table. And that is what the perception is feeding. Mm. But let's come to grips of it that, okay, going forward, as the presidency and the government is making us believe that the future is going to be better, the current situation is just a transition to better uh, you know, uh, conditions that we're going to fight corruption. Governments alone cannot fight corruption, period. They have to realize that, mm. and they have to bring the partnership, civil society, the community at large. That is how we're going to end up. Okay. So when we come back, we will talk about whether or not we've seen signs of an improvement, uh, what any other person out there can do, and how not to give up, even when you're standing alone, which can be very tough. <laughs> We're coming to you from the Fiesta Royale Hotel. Just a reminder that it's a four-star hotel, uh, accommodation conference and banqueting food and beverage. It offers a unique experience. And I want to tell you what they do on Sundays. It's a special Sunday lunch buffet. Celebrate this and every Sunday with family and friends at Fiesta Royale Hotel uh, over a special Sunday lunch buffet at our Mansonia restaurant. Uh, the rate is only 140 Ghana cities per person. Children from zero to five are complimentary and children from six to 11 only pay half the price. Package includes a complimentary welcome drink upon arrival and live band music. It's from 12 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. For reservations and inquiries, you can call 0302-740-81001. 0302-740-81001. Or one. At Fiesta Royale Hotel, we serve you with an unforgettable and peerless experience. So let's talk about how, I mean, we talk about a lot already. It almost it sounds impossible to reverse the trend. So I wonder where we can begin to tackle it from. But I want us to look at the Anas, Anas Exposé, the documentary, the number 12, and what it has done. Almost everybody wants a nurse in their industry. Um, is it the same feeling for the Federation, for instance, for private businesses? For private businesses, what they want to see is the absence of extortion, the demands. Because they, they're not hiding the fact that they pay to do things. But if those in authority, those that are making demands will stop, and if this kind of expose would not bring out that criminal element of demanding before you get, before businesses are conducted. And as Kwame indicated earlier on, the project suffers. I'm a businessman. The project cost is one million. You take 200,000. Yes, I'll do. I'll pay. I also have to have a profit margin. Mm. So if I add my profit margin of 100,000, 300,000 already gone. The project had to be done instead of with one million, 
I do it with uh, 700,000. So the project is going to suffer. The community doesn't get the benefit of what the intent was. So everybody's looking for ways to stop this cyclical, wicked cycle. Because if we do, then the good business people will be able to perform at the maximum of optimized levels that will allow the community to, to benefit from their expertise. But if it doesn't, we all become mediocre. Because I'm using small amounts for a big project that's supposed to be done. The road is 41 kilometers. I'm supposed to tie it. But if you make a demand, I'll shave six inches off each side of the road for 41 kilometers. Do we know how much six inches on each side of the road comes to? A whole lot of money. So everybody is looking at ways that if the big ticket items are addressed, it will sit down. Mm. And the leadership is a critical element. And I, I said beginning that the government is doing something great. They've met with civil society three times already in this young life. What has that resulted in? It results in dialogue, getting to know what is on the ground, getting to know what we are looking at, getting to know what is missing, at least the knowledge and the information, and then pushing the envelope as to the Right of Information Act. That alone, to me, that right information will scare the daylights of the people in charge of those uh, uh, deep pockets. Because I'm going to demand, and you have to create the, tra you know, the audit trail, mm -hmm. and the gaps and the loopholes will be glaring for anybody to see. So that kind of engagement is critical. But it got to be followed by a lot more, a lot more. Because let's address civil society. You are the watchdog. Let's take the recent, what, what do you call it, Kelney, GBG, GBG thing. Mm -hmm. Civil society has requested information. Time has passed. We haven't received it. What is government holding on that to? Do we have to go to court first? Because there's an, a, a law that requires that they provide that information. So the kind of relationship that you cultivate will now allow people to think that, oh, yes, indeed, we are all partners, and we're going to allow civil society of helping civil society to even do that. As we speak, most of the civil society are financed by overseas partners. We're talking about Ghana beyond aid. Yeah. So that, would that include the support for civil society, or it's only aid to government? So we have to sit together and do things that, even though government has the intention of talking about anti-corruption or fighting corruption, fighting corruption is not only uh, the actions that would take the guy in jail. Preventing. Prevention is the key. Because our young generation, if you go to the schools and preach to them, go home and ask your daddy and your mommy, are they corruption crusaders? Go to the synagogue. Go to the church, the religious services. Every Friday, today is Friday. Go to the mosque. Talk, talk to everybody that corruption is bad. It's taking the, your cup away. It's taking your knee away. It's taking your shoes away. People gradually begin to see. You don't, just don't talk. But give the evidence. Use the media as we're talking now to show the evidence, the privation of schools, hospitals, bad roads. Now the rains are here. Roads. The guy has a Mercedes. He stole the money to buy a Mercedes, but he didn't steal the money to fix the road. <laughs> so he's going to drive his beautiful Mercedes on a, a bad road. So he sees the, 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 the detriment of his actions in a reverse way. So I think there's a lot more that collectively we can do, both government. But that's why the government, because they lead. But they should not lead and prevent us from participating. Mr. Tanko, because he, he mentioned Ghana Beyond Aid, I know that Star Ghana has been involved in quite a number of things, and indeed, yeah. we cannot mention the NAS number 12 screening without mentioning Star Ghana. Yeah. A lot of people may not know that, mm. but you're making it possible for people to see, to watch yeah. this documentary. Yeah. Why is that so important? I mean, people watch the documentary and they're very angry, yeah. but what, what, what should be the action? I mean, mm. what, what, should, what should it make people want to do? Yeah. I think um, the supporting the ANAS expose is important for me for two reasons. One is that citizens have a right to information. They need to know what's happening. You know, that's the first one. The second is that until people get angry enough, until they get fed up enough, 
with the situations in which they find themselves, nothing happens. Mm. So this is supposed to be part of that whole process of saying that enough is enough. But, you know, you ask the question about whether the private sector would need ANAS, etc. ANAS is not a solution to corruption. Not at all. And I think if we got the unfortunate impression that we can only fight corruption through ANAS type investigations, then we're making a mistake. It is one of the ways, mm -hmm. but it needs to be complemented by actions by other actors. In, um, I think, 2014, Star Ghana supported ANAS to do something on the DVLA, the driver licenses, etc. Very horrible things came up. Eventually, the Tiger Eye was financing the court cases from their own pockets. But we thought that, you know, fighting corruption is almost like a value chain. Mm -hmm. So pen plus by it might be at a certain point in that value chain, and they see that, well, this thing has come out. This is what we can do. Mm -hmm. Use that to enhance public education. Nana heads the private enterprise federation. Something like that has come. What should the private sector do? Mm -hmm. What should the media do? So that we all see what ANAS does as input to further actions and not an action by itself. Mm -hmm. And just to conclude very briefly on this point, you know, we've always been in search of a magic bullet, a one solution. So Martin Amidu was appointed and we all went, yay, mm -hmm. you know. But he, he needs, for the Office of Special Prosecutor to work, we need a judiciary that will not drag a case for two, three years. We need prosecutors, police prosecutors, etc., that would be on the ball. We need citizens that are willing to provide information. Mm. Martin Amidu by himself is nothing, so to speak, in that sense. He makes a very important contribution, but we need the joined up actions. We need actions by other actors, and that's where um, we, we should situate the work mm. by others. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure, as part of your research, Anas came up. Did ANAS come no, up? No, ANAS did not come up. Uh, <laughs> so I'll describe ANAS as one-time activities, which is very important. It's critical. It's rally people around the world. But uh, as the report pointed out, the Metugu report pointed out, fighting corruption is not one-time activity. Mm -hmm. It's a long, drawn, difficult process. Mm. And half of the time, we lose sight of that fact, and we're looking for quick wins and quick face. And that is not good enough. So we need to look at three levels, policy, laws, and regulations. There are issues to be dealt with at that level. The institutions are quite critical. But for us, citizens' mobilization and participation, and that is missing in all this uh, puzzle, because citizens have a key role to play. Take, for example, the government is quite critical. They are providing leadership. But if they promise to do Y and Z, however, as citizens, we are just looking on, and there's no performance, what will happen? They will not be bothered. Yeah. The president will be committed to fight, uh, 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 to fight against corruption. However, citizens don't remind him that, look, this is what you promise. Of course, he's a busy man. He has a lot of things on his plate. And this may fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. And then I mentioned that we pay periodic visits to the president. And I think one of the value we bring to the table is that we provide him that independent voice. Are you OK? Over and above whatever institutional arrangement that you have that provide information. And the, I think the key message is that this is a process and we need various artists to be involved. And citizens are key to it mm. because they will suffer from the consequences of corruption and they can benefit the most if you fight against it. Mm. We've seen some persons being prosecuted, uh, but often it's when a new government comes, we see prosecution of old. Yes. Sir, yes. Mm. yes. How do we change that? I mean, is it to say that when you're in government, there's no corruption happening? <laughs> I think the detection comes after the fact. And in the course of the tenure of the whoever at the time, they possibly don't look within. They look out over their shoulders who had done what, because the evidence normally is there. On the ongoing, they have not accumulated enough. But if you're a watchdog and you're looking at all the trail, accountability, it wouldn't take anything to track what is ongoing as of today to be able to prosecute. I take comfort in those people who were fired maybe because they couldn't perform or for whatever reason. People should know that they were held accountable 
for the position that they are, 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 are you know, uh, being uh, in charge of. And accountable includes responsibility for the resources that are allocated to them. We have parliament where we have the public uh, accounting uh, you know, uh, reports being heard with a lot of fanfare. What happens after the fact? Even the agencies that are being accused don't get copies of that, of that report. How do we expect them to make changes, to institute measures that will stop it from ongoing? Mm. So we have to have a concurrent action ongoing to stop this uh, perpetration of corruption. Mm. But you see, as you said, is it, am I going to bring uh, Kwame in as my lieutenant and then turn around to prosecute him? I had to give him a terms of reference and say, Kwame, you and I know what we're going to do. If you deviate, regardless of our relationship, but we tend to honor relationship more than honor the responsibility. And if Kwame is doing something, and I want to say the next thing Kwame is going to the, the religious leaders and the chiefs and say, no, 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 this is uh, in, in our culture, Obano or Naswa, if a pie in country. Get the hell out of, excuse me, get this out of the system. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it's wrong. Penalize him, punish him. So his brother, his nephew, his uncle, his relatives, and all the community will know that you had an honor and you abused it mm. and you've been punished for that abusing of that honor. Mm. Just on that issue, I think it's important. That's why I'm talking about one time activity. A big case, it goes to court, the guy has stolen maybe ground corruption, a lot of money. But what we are looking for, and I think the report points out to that is that look, the guys at the district level, are you okay? The guys collecting money, the police guy who have been collecting money for it from all this, yeah. we need to see that they also go to court mm -hmm. and usually they are left out of the picture mm -hmm. or we're looking at the political appointees mm -hmm. that have stolen money and all that but if you go into the ministries and the agencies mm -hmm. the administrators who are also what uh, uh, part and parcel of this mm -hmm. corruption mm -hmm. and I believe that the fight have to be uh, anchored on not only the uh, government appo appointees, yeah. but anybody in the system who is involved in corruption, we have to punish them. Mm. So if at the district level, there, there's a district or magistrate court there, yeah. they are uh, handling small cases yeah. in that direction, that will help. Yeah. yeah. So yes, the big cases are important, the resources that they take are huge, but I believe that we have to look at the uh, the micro level and that's where citizens can relate because in my village if I saw that this guy took the money meant for school feeding and pocketed it mm. and we took him to court and he ended up in jail mm. that's one of the best examples that we can give in a fight against corruption mm. and we don't see a lot of those ones mm. I, I, I think I, I'll bet to differ on that because if you go to Shiraj and you tell Shiraj that you had not prosecuted any corruption cases. They'll give you about 2,000, 3,000 cases they prosecuted. And people and are in jail. And, and people are in jail. But those are all the minors that you're talking about. Mm. But people, the minors don't spread out. Mm. And people don't get to know about the minor issues. Mm. People get to know the, what are not the yeah, big yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. Because the yeah, yeah. big ones, as you said, carry a lot more, a lot more impact. And so people learn from that, ooh, so if you're in a, a, a position where you have access to 10 million mm. and you take 6 million, what is going to happen? What is happening is the danger that we don't even look at. The guy has 6 million at his disposal. There are investigations that are going on. He can influence that, and they do influence that. So at the end of the day, how come this guy was not prosecuted? Mm. Because he was able to skew the, this, yes. the system in a way that favored him, and he stays out of jail. Mm. These are the kind of loopholes that we have to block, loopholes that we have to stop, because the investigators have to be investigated as well. Yes. But who Just watches the watchman? That's somebody who yeah. says. <laughs> and I think the importance of strong institutions cannot be discounted in this uh, um, situation. Um, I remember the um, issue around um, one of Donald Trump's uh, secretaries, I think the Secretary of the Interior, etc., who has been, you know, reported, I think, to Congress, to the FBI, for the way he's used, you know, government resources for private this in the official plane and etc. Yeah. And this is an institution independent of the presidency yeah. that could say this is this, you know. But for us, because of the power of the presidency, you do it, you are asked to proceed on leave. Um, we have institutions that we set up to take a box, but in terms of how these institutions are resourced, no. Okay. 
you know. So I think the importance of strong institutions that can give citizens confidence mm. that when we report this, action will be taken irrespective of your political color will be quite important. Thank you, gentlemen.